Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to this lecture series on spatial statistics and spatial econometrics. Uh, today we are going to be uh, covering uh, lecture 8 which is a shift from what we have been doing till now. So in the previous uh, lecture or couple of lectures we have studied this idea of entropy and how do we interpret uh, the, the entropy of a random process uh, to a spatially delineated uh, 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 random function space, right? So today we are going to sort of move slightly uh, away from that, uh, uh, you know, that topic. And we are going to look at spatial autocorrelation and its consequence for estimation of sample mean. So the first entity of discussion today is this uh, idea of spatial autocorrelation. So what is spatial autocorrelation? Spatial autocorrelation is a measure, is a measure of dependence among random variables in space, okay. So, you know, till now we have talked about uh, something like a distance, we have talked about spatial dependence with examples, right. Now we are coming to a point where we are providing a measure for it, right? So we are, we are talking about a measure and this measure will likely depend on or will be a function of the distance, uh, you know, uh, 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 between random variables in space. Of course, spatial autocorrelation is what binds random variables in space and ultimately lends them to become a random function, right? We said that random function is nothing but a collection of random variables which are jointly distributed. Now, spatial autocorrelation provides a specific mechanism for jointedness in the distribution of random variables in space, right? So, to make our, you know, understanding slightly more clear, we can sort of take a small example, right? We can, we can say, let's say we have random variable realizations for three locations in space. Three locations in space are given as S1, S2 and S3, okay? Now, the random variable that is realized, let's say it's given by Z. So Z S1 is the random variable realization at location S1, Z S2 is realization on location S2 and Z S3 is similarly realization on S3. We can, we can also define these as with simply indices Z1, Z2 and Z3 where the index 1, 2 and 3 are delineating the location or differentiation between these. Uh, random variable realizations, right? Now, the point is that uh, when we talk about spatial autocorrelation, the idea is that first of all, correlation between Z1 and Z2, correlation between uh, Z2, uh, Z1 and Z3, and correlation between Z2 and Z3, these are, these are the unique pairs in which the data occurs as in our example. So, these correlation metrics are individually non-zero. So there is a likelihood that either all of them are non-zero or at least one of these pairs exhibit non-zero correlation. Now this correlation is often, you know, a function of distance, of distance between, uh, you know, uh, 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 individual pairs. pairs, right? So if they are function of distance, that's why, you know, they are using an entity which is defined over space between these variables and hence these are met measures of spatial autocorrelation. Why autocorrelation? Because it's the same, you know, uh, uh, entity Z, let's say it's groundwater level. So if groundwater level at location S1, at location S2, at location S3, they are all groundwater levels, but they are 
correlated with each other. So it's called autocorrelation. So it's Z crown water level at location S1 is correlated with itself at location at S2 and at location at S3. Right. So that's the that's the point of 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 you know uh, 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 of of spatial autocorrelation. Right. So this is what provides a uh, you know a definition to spatial autocorrelation. So it's correlation in the traditional sense, but then as a function of distance in space. Right. However, we define it. it can be Manhattan distance. It could be Euclidean distance, great arc distance, or even more sophisticated distance metrics that we discussed in one of the earlier lectures, right? Okay, so uh, the next point is, okay, so let's say we are given these three data points. So we are given these three data points, right? And we want to understand what is the mean, what is the mean or the sample mean of, you know, these data realizations. So the sample mean is straightforward. You know, all of you understand what I mean by that. I'm basically taking Z1, Z2 and Z3 and I'm summing them with equal weights of one third, or I'm just summing them and dividing them by three, or you know, I can simply say it's one third times Z1 plus one third times uh, Z2 plus one third times Z3, right? So we are applying these equal weights because you know, any of these values could occur, uh, you know, when I'm talking about the best guess of what the mean value would be, right? So any of these values are equally likely to occur in space. So uh, they are all realizations of, of uh, you know, they're all realizations of a random process. So we say that the best guess of what the mean of this, uh, you know, random process would be uh, given the sample data set I have is simply add them with equal weights of one third each, right? So Z1 plus Z2 plus Z3 by three, okay? This is what we call as Z bar. And if we go and revisit the title of today's lecture, it says spatial autocorrelation and its consequence for estimation of mean. So, you know, our aim going forward in this lecture is to evaluate, evaluate the role of spatial autocorrelation in, uh, on Z bar. Spatial autocorrelation is nothing but non-zero correlation among random variables in space, right? So we want to see if you have this correlation, this dependence metric, uh, you know, how does it affect the mean, right? Where does it affect, I mean, the mean, does it at all affect it or not, right? And uh, so what we will do is in order to proceed, in order to proceed, we will first consider the case where, where they are independent, right? So we will first, first consider the, let's say, consider the IID case. What is IID case? Which IID means independently and identically distributed or vice versa. I mean, you can say identically and independently distributed random variables. Distributed. Okay, so independently and identically distributed random variables or vice versa, identically and independently distributed random variables. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's begin our evaluation of that case. Okay, so we say consider a sequence of IID random variables Z1, Z2, Z3, go all the way till Zn, right? Now here the indices, the indices 1, 2, till n um, represent location, just like we saw in the previous, uh, you know, uh, 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 slide, right? With the pointer that the random variable realizations at these locations are completely random, right? So in case of IID, you know, with the condition 
that random variable realizations at these locations are completely random okay what does it mean that basically means that the value of value realized at location 1 that is z1 has got nothing to do with the realizations at locations 2 till n that is z2 z3 till zn whatever those values uh, or realizations are they have no bearing on what we realize on location 1 that is the value z1 similarly what we realize on location n that is zn has had no bearing from what we had realized on location 1 that is z1 or z2 or z3 all the way till z n minus 1 right so 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 that would mean that they are completely random that there is no relationship or dependence spatially or otherwise right so we can say that is no relation or dependence uh, spatially I'm just going to focus on spatially uh, speaking because that's what the scope of this course is. But otherwise, what I'm saying is they are completely random, right? So there, there's no other kind of, uh, you know, grouping, clustering going on in this data pattern. So um, mathematically, we say we have a sequence Z1, Z2 till Zn such that we say Zi is distributed Iid normal mean mu variance sigma square. So now there is a new piece of information that these are not only independently identically distributed, but they are distributed according to the normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma square. So we know from here, we know that mu hat, mu hat is nothing but the sample estimate of the mean mu, right? So mu hat is nothing but the sample estimate of mu is nothing but summation i equals 1 to n z i divided by n okay which is also notated as uh, denoted as z bar right so in previous case we had three uh, you know realizations there we had z1 plus z2 plus z3 by 3 because their n was equal to 3 right here we have a more general case but the, the definition remains exactly the same we also know that sigma hat squared, which is the sample variance, uh, you know, representative of sigma squared, which is the distribution population variance, is equal to summation i equals 1 to n z i minus z bar, the whole square divided by n minus 1. Okay. Now, I want you to sort of ask yourselves or you know uh, uh, try and answer uh, in the next uh, 30 seconds the where does this minus 1 come from in the denominator okay so I'm asking why why minus 1 in the denominator okay so to be able to understand why do we have minus 1 in the denominator, well, we must recall the concept of degrees of freedom. What is the concept of degrees of freedom? Well, the degrees of freedom provide us an understanding or a measure of the net variation in data that we are using to define sigma hat squared, okay? Now, when we, when we write down, when we define sigma hat squared, we are indeed, we are indeed summing n entities, right? So we are summing n entities, right? n entities uh, which are distinct, which are distinct due to unique uh, unique sorry about that spelling mistake okay uh, okay unique z i's right 
Now, uh, now the point is, but we are also using Z bar, you know, but, okay, so we have unique ZI, so we have Z1, which is different from Z2, which is different from Z3, which is different from Z4, all the way through Zn. Note that they can be similar values as far as realization. It is possible that, you know, when they are realized as random entities, it so happens randomly that Z1 is exactly equal to Z5. But they are still distinct entities. They are, they are, they are drawn at, di at distinct locations. They are drawn independently. They are drawn identically. So they are distinct entities, right? So they are not supposed to be uh, same if they appear to be randomly same numbers, right? So the sequence can have same uh, values uh, at different locations, but they are still distinct entities by the virtue of a location and the fact that they have been independently drawn, uh, you know, at that, at that location. So we are summing n entities in the numerator, which are distinct due to these unique zi's, right? Indexed by location i. But we also use z bar in the definition. And if you realize z bar is nothing but a function of n z i's, right? So here is here is z bar, and it is a function of you know, uh, and Z i's. So if Z bar is a function of, you know, these Z i's, what it really means is that you can give me any N minus one Z i's and I, I will back out the Nth Z i, right? Because, because I know Z bar in the definition of sigma hat squared, right? You can, you can give me Z one till Z N minus one and Z bar and I will back out Z N. Or you can give me Z one to z n minus two and z n and not give me z n minus one and give me z bar, I will back out z n minus two, the missing value. You can, you can drop out any one, you know, z i in the sequence of z one to z n and allow me to use z bar, I can back out the, the remaining, uh, you know, z i. So what happens is due to this way that we have defined, uh, you know, uh, 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 sigma hat squared, where we use all i z i's, distinct z i's, and we use z bar. In the net, what we are saying is we are we are only exploiting the variation of uh, you know n minus one z i's, right? We can live with just n minus one z i's and z bar. That is all the information that I need, right? So the net variation that is being derived from the given sample in order to calculate sigma hat squared really just comes from n minus one z i values, right? So I'm gonna just write here that one degree of freedom lost due to the use of z bar in definition of sigma hat squared right, which implies we are using the net variation in sample equivalent, equivalent to n minus one distinct entities, okay. So we are really just on the net end, uh, variation is coming from n minus one entities, right? The net variation is coming from n minus one entities. This is really important. And you must go back and uh, re take a relook at the idea of degrees of freedom, right? But it's really important to realize that, you know, there is a n minus one and why does this minus one appear? This concept will appear again and again in any statistics course, not just this one. Uh, so this knowledge is, is kind of general. Okay, so the next important issue is the variance of Z bar. So now, why do we have a variance of Z bar? Well, what is Z bar? So note that Z bar is nothing but a best guess of the mean mu from sample information, from what we know in the sample, right? So Z bar itself, itself, is a best guess, right? It is only a best guess of what the population mean mu is 
of mu uh, given sample information right so when i'm given the sample all i know is that you know we have entities z1 till zn what would be what would the sample mean be well it would be it could be it could be equally likely that mu mu will appear to be any one of these entities right so what do we really do we give each entity an equal weight so we equally weigh each zi that is with the weight 1 over n and then we simply sum them right so we we weigh each zi we get zi by n and we simply sum them and we get our z bar that's our best guess that's our expectation of what mu will be right given sample information and that z bar it's is also a random variable okay why well it is composed of random variables z i till z 1 till z n right so if you have z bar which is just a linear function of n random variables then of course it itself is a uh, random variable so z bar is also a random variable because it is a sum of n random variables right so it must also have a variance just like random variable z i has a variance therefore z bar should also have a variance so therefore z bar must also have a variance so till now we have just resolved that z bar will have a variance now we will go next to the next step and ask what will that what is that variance uh, you know uh, value so we will now next uh, you know what we will do is we will derive this variance of z bar so variance of z bar is nothing but variance of 1 over n summation i equals 1 to n z i now i will 1 over n it's a constant it will come out of the variance operator as 1 by n squared and i have variance of z1 plus z2 plus z3 plus uh, dot 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 plus z n okay now we in evaluating the variance of uh, of the sum of n random variables you know let's recall that the variance of two random variables x the sum of random variables x and y that is variance of x plus y is nothing but variance of x plus variance of y plus two covariance of x and y okay so this is the covariance uh, this is the variance of sum of two random variables so let's extend that to the variance of n random variables so it will be 1 over n square times variance of z1 plus variance of z2 plus variance of z3 plus dot 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 variance of zn plus two covariance of each pair z1 and z2 plus two covariance of z1 and z3 plus and you will keep going and get all the distinct pairs with a uh, you know to get a covariance twice of the covariance and finally you will likely have zn minus 1 and zn right now <clears throat> um, interestingly all of these covariance terms are equal to 0 individually and obviously when summed together they are all 0 because because why well because uh, z i's are independently distributed that's i i d one of the i's basically says that z i's are independently distributed so what does independently distributed imply well independently distributed or this term independently the consequence is that the covariance of any pair z i and z j will be 0 if i is not equal to j <clears throat> right so 
That's great. So we, our problem is much more simplified. So variance of z bar is 1 over n squared. Variance of z1 plus variance of z2 plus variance of z3 plus dot 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 plus variance of zn, right? Which can be now written even more simply as summation i equals 1 to n variance of zi. Why can I write, uh, why can I sort of uh, use this index because you know I'm just summing the look, uh, the, the variance of uh, you know random variable realizations at location i's. And this can be further simplified as 1 over n squared uh, summation i equals 1 to n sigma squared. Why could I do that? Because they are also all identically distributed, right? So this is because you have identically distributed zi's with normal mean mu and variance sigma squared. So all these, you know, uh, zi's have the same variance sigma squared, sigma squared, sigma squared, right? So if I'm summing sigma squareds n times, all I'm going to have is n sigma squared over n squared. And finally, variance of z bar is going to be sigma squared by n. Okay, so the variance of, uh, let's write it again. So the variance of z bar we have figured out is nothing but sigma squared by n. Okay. <clears throat> So, now the fact is that the sample estimate, the sample estimate, we know the sample estimate of sigma squared is equal to sigma hat squared. So, the sample estimate, uh, the variance of z bar from information that we have from the sample is given as sigma hat squared divided by n, where sigma hat squared was defined previously, where we sort of had a little discussion on the degrees of freedom idea as well, okay? So now, uh, 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 having sort of, you know, understood that, uh, we can write the standard deviation of, uh, you know, we can write standard deviation of z bar. Similarly, it will be sigma over root n, and, uh, you know, this will imply this, and the variance of z bar will imply standard deviation of z bar to be given as sigma hat by root n, okay? So with that understanding, now we will move to the next step, which is called as the statistical variance. The statistical, sorry, the statistical inference, not statistical variance, I'm sorry about that. So we have the next topic being statistical inference. So the idea is that, you know, we are trying to get at the sample uh, you know, estimates of uh, 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 mu and sample estimate of, uh, you know, uh, sigma squared. Now, the sample estimate of mu, which is z bar, itself is a random variable. So, it's going to be, it's our best guess, but there can be some error, right? There can be some error. The idea is that I have data, which is all distributed according to the same identical distribution, where, which is normal with mean, mu and, you know, uh, variance sigma squared, okay? Now, you have data sequenced such that you, let's say you have z10 here, you had z1 here, z3 here, you know, z4 here, you had z5 here, you had z51 here, and z6 here, and z, you know, eight here and so on and so forth. So we basically have the sequence of values which are, you know, uh, 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 placed somewhere on the real number line. And the idea is that you have normal distribution with mean mu and, uh, you know, variance sigma squared. So the best guess of mu that we have is the mean of these values, which is likely to be somewhere here, which is the value z bar. Now, this z bar, as we said, is basically a best guess of all the different realizations of zi's that I have in my sample, right? The idea of z bar is that it can take any value with equal weight between in the in this set of z1 to zn, right? So, the idea is that z 
bar itself is a representation of what we expect of the mean to be, right? And there could be some error. So we are aware, you know, of a strategy to, to, to articulate this error or possibility of error in my best guess of mu. And the way I write it is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that we can say that uh, 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 that uh, um, um, that mean value lies in the following interval interval with 95% confidence okay what is the idea of a 95% confidence? The idea is that, look, I mean, I'm going to give you a best guess based on what my sample information is, but it comes with some error. So I'm not going to restrict myself to just Z bar. I'm going to give you an interval with, within which you can understand the mean to lie in, right? So the Z bar value itself for a different random sample with the same distribution, uh, you know, understanding might have slightly different values right, depending on what sample information appears, but we can get a sense of what that value will be with 95% confidence. And we know, you know, if you've studied basic statistics, you, you will recognize that you will, you can write this value as Z bar minus 1.96 uh, Z hat by root N and Z bar plus 1.96 Z sigma hat uh, by root n okay so what i'm saying is that okay you know this is the standard deviation this is the standard deviation of z bar so what i do is i go from z bar 1.96 sigma hat by root n on the left i go the same distance on the right and i say that z bar is going to be lying in this interval with 95% probability. Okay, so now I do not want to provide you a point estimate, I provide you an interval estimate. Okay, so values that are outside of this bound. So let's say, you know, you had a value Z10 and you ask, okay, do you think Z bar could be equal to Z10? You'd say, no, it's outside the 95%, uh, you know, uh, 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 confidence interval. So my, my guess is that Z bar will not be equal to Z n. So that's statistical inference. We are using the idea of errors to get as at, at statistical inference. So uh, this 1.96 times sigma hat by root n is called uh, error in our best guess okay and where does where does 1.96 come from well you should uh, there i will say recall the t statistic okay the students t test the t statistic and i encourage you to go back and read about it if you want to understand where the where does 1.96 come from if you go to a t table on the back of any statistics uh, book and you look for a uh, you know uh, the critical value of t for 95 percent confidence or five percent error uh, that is two-sided five percent error uh, you will uh, you will uh, you know uh, see that for very large degrees of freedom the critical value turns out to be 1.96 so you can locate this on a t table go and locate it Go and read about t statistic it will become clearer another interpretation of this uh, of this idea of this range is that 95 percent so alternative interpretation and then we'll move to the next uh, step okay so what is the alternative interpretation the alternative interpretation is that 90 percent of the data in sequence in sequence Z1, Z2, Z3 till Zn lies in the interval, lies in the interval 
the same interval z bar minus 1.96 sigma hat by n root n and z bar plus 1.96 sigma hat by root n. Okay, so just like in the previous example on the previous, I mean the example on the previous page, you saw that z z10, z51 are outside of the confidence bound. That is z z bar minus 1.96 root sigma uh, sigma hat by root n, and z bar plus 1.96 uh, times sigma hat by root n. So there are two values. There will be about five percent data in the sequence that we have, which will be outside these bounds, those are the data points we will say that these are probably not going to be the values of z bar, right? So z bar will not take those values in all likelihood, even if you gave me a different random sample, which was iid n with same mu and same sigma squared. Okay, so this is statistical inference. And now having understood, having understood this idea, we will next Next, what we will do is a next step that we will take is that we will introduce spatial autocorrelation to this, to our example, that is example sequence uh, Z1, Z2 till Zn and evaluate and evaluate the impacts on mean and statistical inference based on the mean on it, on the mean itself, right? So let's do that in the next, uh, you know, uh, in the next module. Thank you.